present here and now. And in the awareness of God present, let us pray. Father, Mother, God, we give thanks for this opportunity to be aware of your presence in this moment. We breathe in and breathe out. Feeling the power of life moving through us. We breathe in and we breathe out feeling the power of your love moving through us. We breathe in and we breathe out in the realization of the power that you have given us. to be your creative force in this moment. And for those in our awareness that seem to have a need for the awareness of your presence in their lives, we hold them in consciousness and we see them embraced, lifted, transformed, by your presence, your love, your vital energy. And for our friend Paul, whose father recently passed, we hold Paul, Pam, Jack's whole family and friends. We hold them in the embrace of your love. For this opportunity to be ministers of your word, we give thanks. And so it is that together we say, Amen. Welcome to our internet audience. We are going to be talking about prosperity today. That often generates a fair amount of questions. So for those of you in our internet audience, if you want to tweet questions, do that to Living Water Unity, and uh, I'll pick them up at the end of the service, and uh, perhaps I'll have something to say about them. Well, um, okay, I, it, it's now time to finish the saga of the table, and, and the reason for that is that I finished the table, but a, as you may recall, this happened four weeks ago. Uh, this was about three weeks ago. Uh, this was uh, about a week ago, actually, and uh, we got to flip it over and see what the top side looked like. All before, it was upside down, right, laying on a piece of particle board. And so there you see the cracks. You may see the cracks, but that crack running there and there and there and there. And uh, here was a preparation because I was putting resin down in the crack, uh, I needed to make sure that the resin didn't flow too far away from the crack just because of the uh, uh, cleanup issues. And then uh, there it is. It's done. Yay! <laughs> I got up this morning and the hall light was on. And I figured it was uh, either Troy having to come up to the bathroom or, or uh, uh, you know, wandering around at night. And it turns out it was Linda. Linda said that she got up at 2.30 and went out and sat in the dining room because it was so nice to have that back in shape. So that, that was what I was doing yesterday. I was uh, finishing up and cleaning up so that we could have that room back. And God knows we need every room we can get. All right, so there it is. I will not talk about the table anymore. Yay, yeah, exactly. So... Prosperity. We've been talking about prosperity, and we've been using Charles Fillmore's book, uh, Prosperity. I've been using it anyway as a stimulation for this uh, discussion. And uh, I, I also mentioned, I think I mentioned last week, my 
hesitant to talk about prosperity from the perspective that the prosperity gospel, which is very popular in some segments of Christianity, has always turned me off. I just couldn't get my hands around this idea of tithing so that I would get reward, right? I mean, that's the essence of the prosperity gospel, is that if you please God, God will bless you. And the way you please God is you pour money into God's coffers, whatever that means. I'm, I'm, I know what many ministers interpret that to mean. It means that this is the coffer right here. Just pour your money in there. So that has never set with me well. And uh, it, it turns out that, that Fillmore has something to say about that. He said in page 161 of the book Prosperity, he says, we are not studying prosperity to become rich, but to bring out those characteristics that are fundamental to prosperity. We must learn to develop the faculty that will bring prosperity and the character that is not spoiled by prosperity. Indeed, the idea of talking about prosperity is about talking about our creative power. Our creative power in this, in this uh, incarnation. And the importance of talking about our creative power is because it underscores, it makes salient who we are with respect to God. And that is an important understanding. Who are we? Who are we as individuals walking this physical plane with respect to this all that is all, as we consider it to be in unity? And so what is our relationship with that all that is all? And so prosperity as a topic will bring forth those aspects of our creative power. And you've uh, seen me, you've seen me talk about the creative process. I'd like you to consider this parable that Jesus offered uh, as it's documented here in Mark. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have uh, much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Well, what is this parable about? <coughs> it's recounted several times in the New Testament, so obviously the writers of the New Testament felt that it was an important thing to repeat. So what is the truth of this parable? It's really not about agronomy, is it? It's not about how to be a, a good farmer. I mean, good farmers would know that you don't plant seeds on the path. You have to get from here to there, so it's not going to grow. You also know that you don't plant it in the thorns. Of course not. Well, that's not the point of this parable. The point of this parable is talking about our creative process. And as we look at this passage, uh, I'm going to offer you a metaphysical interpretation of this. Now, about metaphysical interpretation. Metaphysical interpretation is about my own understanding of this scripture as it relates to me. Now, I'm charged with the responsibility of standing up here and filling time on Sunday morning, so I'm going to share with you what this means to me. But I encourage you not to accept my word for what it means, but rather to consider it yourself. And at the bottom of the notes section in the bulletin, you have a link to uh, truthunity.net. That truthunity.net has just a whole wealth of resources that allow you not just a review of the unity literature, and there's really a substantial amount there, but also to do a metaphysical interpretation of this material yourself. And the two sources that you would use would be either Revealing 
revealing word or the metaphysical Bible dictionary. But you are aided in that process because it gives you the American Standard Version of the Bible, which Fillmore used. Okay, this is back in the, in the early 20th century. So that was the book that he was using. And it gives you links then to various words that, are, that exist either in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary or the Revealing Word. When I went through ministerial school, I didn't have that. This is such a wonderful tool. Make use of it. Okay, so as we look at this passage, we have to say, okay, it's not about farming. It's not about how to uh, foster plants but rather it's about how we engage ourselves in the creative process. Fillmore offers us this definition of seed, and we'll come back to this passage. And this is in the Revealing Word. And the seed is a generative center through which intelligence manipulates substance and produces form. In itself, it is powerless to produce anything, but it is the avenue through which interior forces manifest in the outer. Man draws on the universal forces within and without, just as the tree draws on the invisible spirit and earth, air, and water. So the seed is the gener generative force. It is that aspect of our conscious experience that it is from that that our inspiration arises. Okay. So going back to this passage then, we have the... The circumstance where the seed has fallen on the path, it's eaten by birds. It falls on rocky ground, not very much soil for it to take root. And so it dies quickly. It falls into the thorns and it's choked. So obviously it can't grow. And then it falls on good soil. So what are these various conditions? One condition is that the seed falls on the path and it's eaten by birds. That is the inspired, that's the seed, that's the inspired thought that is not attended to. Okay? You have this, oh, wow, what a great idea. And then the alarm rings. And you've got to get up, you've got to go to work, you've got to do your things, and you forget about it. Okay? So that's the seed that falls on the path and eaten by birds. Then there is the seed that falls on rocky ground. And there is no soil. And the rocky ground is that which is, th those are the seeds that are not followed with faith. And we'll talk about the creative process here in just a moment, and you can relate to it. But these are the, these are the, the uh, creative inspirations that are not followed with faith. And we'll talk about some of the re reasons why not. Then we have the thorns. The thorns are... Um, the, the seeds that fall into the thorns and are choked by the thorns are those inspired thoughts that are turned to the service of ego. Okay? These are the thoughts that, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great if I could set up a homeless shelter? Right? We need a homeless shelter. And then you get into the budgeting process and you say, well, you know, as a director of homeless shelter, I'm going to need to have a fairly good salary. Because that, of course, is a high-tension job it's of great service to the community. So I deserve to be paid well. Okay, nothing wrong with being paid well. That's not the issue. The issue is that you take this inspired thought and you turn it into the service of the ego. And what happens is that, yeah, the plant may take root, but all of a sudden you find yourself like the director of uh, United Way some 10 years ago. And uh, you find that you're in a position where all of a sudden your salary is known to the masses and contributions to United Way plummets. Okay? That's stranded, uh, uh, that's uh, um, <sighs> choked by thorns. Okay, and then there is the seed that, plant, that lands on good ground. And the seed that lands on good ground takes root and is nourished and grows. Those are the thoughts that are followed with faith. They are put to the service of spirit. And they indeed yield great bounty. Why? Well, because other people see what a wonderful idea that is. Right? And they say, yeah, like Habitat for Humanity. They say, wow. Wow. That is a great idea. Let's, let's contribute. Let's 
pitch in because I want to be a part of that. So the seeds that fall on good ground are the seeds that are multiplied by the efforts of many. Make sense? Does this parable have a different appearance to, to you now? It has a, it has a long-lasting, and that's one of the aspects of Scripture, it is long-lasting, but it has a long-lasting application. It's not about 2,000 years ago, but it's about today. It's about something that we can apply today. Well, let's take a look then at this that you have seen before. Yes, it's the creative process. I want to talk to you about it a little bit in the context of this parable. And so we have the idea being put into form within divine mind. And the, that, that should extend all across the wall and wrap around the room and the ceiling and the floor. Divine mind is everywhere. It's not bounded here. But the idea is turned into form as a result of are accessing this realm of substance. This is an intangible realm out of which these ideas arise. And as a result of our thoughts, we manipulate those ideas and put them into manifestation. And as a result of that effort, we see the intangible becoming tangible. Now, if we have followed according to the seeds planted in good soil, those ideas will become manifest and they will thrive. However, if our inspiration is not attended to, then nothing happens, right? Seeds on the path, eaten by birds. If, on the other hand, they fall on rocky ground and they grow up, what is happening here? What's happening is that we are seeing the uh, the, the ideas that are not followed through by faith. We're seeing things that come into this, oh, well, you know, this is going to, it, we're not, we're not going to have the necessary resources, or this is an idea that, eh, you know, I was drunk at the time, and that maybe it's not such a great idea after all. Well, that may be true. But, uh, the idea then is not followed through with faith. And then there are the assumptions that can kill an inspired idea. The lack of resources, the lack of manpower, the lack of desire, or the lack of demand for whatever that idea is. And then the attention that we attend to it. <coughs> so we have the thorns that, that choke these divine ideas when those divine ideas are put into the service of ego. And that happens here at the intention stage. Okay? I redirect this divine idea to be something that is going to cause me to be rich and famous in some way. Or powerful. Rich, famous, and powerful. Maybe all three. Maybe I could run for president someday. Okay. So the intentions are redirected into the service of the ego. Then we have the seeds that, are, that fall on good ground. They are inspired. Our intentions are worthy. We are, we are not, we are not uh, curtailing our efforts with invalid assumptions. That we are assuming that the resources will be there when they are needed. That we're, that we're assuming that while I don't see the throng of people attending uh, to this idea now, I'm going to go ahead because I have faith that this is good. And so it is through the attention then that we, that we take that inspired idea with the, with the uh, great intentions, with the, lack, with, with the lack of limiting assumptions, and we bring it into manifestation. And all of this requires that we have faith. Okay? All of this requires that we have faith. And one of the aspects of prosperity teaching is that we allow this creative process and we see that it is faith that will get us through, and it is fear that will kill it. All right? So the intention of the prosperity teaching is to eliminate the fear and get back to the faith. All right? So, releasing the fear opens our path, our creative powers to our creative powers, 
And Fillmore offers us this in page 152 of Prosperity. If you have been in the habit of hoarding or of practicing stringent economy, change your thought currents to generosity. Practice giving, even though it may be in a small way. Give in a spirit of love and give when you cannot see any possibility of return. Put real substance into your gift by giving the substance of the heart with the token of money or whatever it is, service or whatever. Through the power of your word, you can bless and spiritually multiply everything that you give. His point here is that if you do not allow fear to get in the way, and instead you allow your giving to be based on love, and we talked about this last week, if you allow your giving to be based on love, then you are going to see that your efforts are multiplied. Put real substance in your gift by giving the substance of the heart. That is love. Through the power of your word, you can bless and spiritually multiply everything that you give. <coughs> so it's, you know, we, we have this idea that charity is a good thing. Charity, as I would define it, and you can define it other ways, but for purposes of this talk, let me define it this way. Charity is to fill a need based upon the fear that that need is not going to be fulfilled. Charity would be to uh, give to the children's hospital because you've heard that the children's hospital budget is falling short. And you have a fear that the uh, shortfall is going to create issues in the leukemia ward, say. All right. And in fact, there are uh, there are donors all across the country that see that kind of charity as being one that is fulfilling. Well, maybe it may be fulfilling, but it's fulfilling to the ego. Why? Because you're saying, oh, aren't I great? Haven't I done a wonderful thing? I've given to the leukemia award. Now, take that gift to the leukemia award and give it in a different spirit. Give it with a different intention. Not to fulfill some budgetary shortfall, but rather to recognize that you have resources that you are the steward of. All of the resources that all of us have are really resources of God. And so if we consider the resources that we have, whether it's a penny or it's a million bucks, regardless whatever resources we have, if we consider to those to be resources of God put in our hands to serve God's love, then we have a different attitude, don't we? We're not fulfilling some kind of we're, we're not addressing some kind of fear that we have that there's a budget f shortfall but rather we're recognizing that the wonderful resources that we have can be put into service right do you see the difference you're not re addressing the fear but rather you're allowing love to be your motive force and that is an important aspect, not of the amount of money that lands in the coffers of Children's Hospital. It's going to be the same million bucks one way or the other, right? And how they handle that million bucks is going to be up to them. That's out of your domain. That is not your responsibility, nor is it your authority. However, for you, in giving the million bucks... If you are addressing fear, what you're doing is you're reinforcing this consciousness of lack. If you, on the other hand, give to be a steward of the resources, recognizing that Children's Hospital has a greater need for that than uh, Habitat for Humanity, it's not about fear, but it's rather about steward and allocating the resources where the resources are most to be <coughs> put to greatest use. That makes sense? Same situation. The only difference is how we address it. And that is what is important in our own spiritual growth. All right. So, Fillmore offered us this. And then, 
he comes on with, do not give with any idea that you're bestowing <laughs> charity. The idea of charity has infested the race consciousness for thousands of years and is responsible for the great army of human dependence. Do all you can to annul this mental error. There is no such thing as charity as popularly understood. Everything belongs to God and all his children are equally entitled to it. The fact that one has a surplus and gives some to another does not make the one a benefactor and the other a dependent. The one is with the surplus is simply a steward of God and is merely discharging the work of his stewardship. That makes sense? That feel different? Feel different? Okay. Well, so let us look at this passage that you've seen perhaps a thousand times, maybe more. Matthew 6, 24 to 26, actually 33. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. God is about the expression of love. Wealth is about the fear of loss. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or what, about your body, what you will wear. Is not, life, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They eat neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not one? Are you not of more value than they? And they, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. First, for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It is about transforming your consciousness of fear and addressing the fears in your life to a consciousness of love and being that benefactor that offers the steward, that offers your resources in love. In love, in love, in love, in love. It's about rephrasing, re, re, uh, reframing. Your consciousness. It's not about the external conditions. You're still responding to the external conditions as you're, as you're responding. But it's about reframing the, the intentions that you have in responding to those external conditions. It is about the choice. And that choice is completely here. It's not about there. It's here. Okay? It's a choice. And we'll have our meditation. As As we enter into this moment, allow us to enter in in love. Letting go of fear. Resting in this moment. In love. And in this time in mind, let us look upon some fear that we have in our condition, in our circumstances, perhaps in our relationships, but bring that fear to mind. And we all have them. So find one. And allow yourself to rest with that fear. It's okay. No one needs to know what fear you're resting with. But in this resting with the fear, consider the fear itself. From what did it arise? Why is it fearful to you? You'll likely find 
Somewhere in the back of that fear is a sense of lack. A lack of security or a lack of confidence or a lack of resources. Perhaps even a lack of love for to be sure fear is a lack of love. But consider the lack itself. Notice that your sense of lack is somehow grounded in your desire to love. You want to support a person or a relationship. You want to transform a condition. Interestingly, fear is grounded in love. Now consider the love itself. The lack being based or grounded in love. Consider the love itself. And focus on that love. Feel how it feels. Allow that feeling to expand, to spill over from your heart into your whole being advancing into the dark corners, erasing the doubts, dissolving the fears. Feel that love grow and expand. And knowing that God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. Realize that the fear will be subsumed by the love. It will be replaced. Feel that love grow and express from you into the conditions, into the relationships, into the circumstances that once in a distant memory held fear. But now is embraced by love. But in that realization, in that frame of consciousness, we come back to this time and space, sharing the words of the Lord's Prayer.